Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Okay, welcome back. So let's continue our discussion of CMOS circuits and CMOS logic. So just by way of quick review, we talked in the last lecture about the basic circuit, the CMOS inverter, it consists of a P-channel device in series with an N-channel device. Input voltage is applied to the two gates of the transistors. The output voltage is taken from the two drains of the transistors. And the circuit has a very nice property that very little current flows in the static condition. The current mainly flows when we're doing switching. It has good noise margins, especially if we have transistors that have that saturate well and have a good out high output resistance. And what we want to do in this lecture is to understand two things. You know, what determines the speed and what determines the power consumed in this particular circuit. So let's look. We're, we're now dealing with time-dependent signals, and we're going to look at a transition when the input voltage goes from low to high and uh, see if we can understand what happens. Now in this case, I need to connect my output to something. Typically my output is going to be connected to some other transistors. There may be fan out, it may be con connected to several other transistors. It's connected to wires that send the signals across the chips. I'm going to represent all of that by this capacitor CSW. It's the capacitance that is switched during the transition and it's the sum of all those capacitors at that drain, at the two drain nodes. Okay, so uh, our input voltage is going to look something like this. It's low until some time T0 and then it abruptly switches to the power supply voltage and stays constant. And we're interested in understanding what happens to the output voltage. So you can see physically what's going to happen. While the device was, while the input voltage was low, then this circuit charged up the output capacitors to VDD because the low input produces a high output. So we've got the uh, capacitor charged up to a voltage of VDD. Now when we switch the NMOS on, it's like a short circuit to ground. All of that charge is dumped to ground and the voltage drops back down to zero. So the output voltage is going to undergo a transition like this. The initial zero input produced a one output. Then we switch and we'll find that the initial decay of the voltage is approximately linear. And as we, after we decay a while, then the decay becomes approximately exponential. So we'll get a transition that looks like that. And we're kind of interested in how long does it take to make this transition? How long does it take to convert a one into a zero or vice versa? So let's just look at this, you know, let's just, we've already pre-charged our output capacitor to VDD. Let's just look at the time it takes to discharge that and switch it to a zero. So I don't need to worry about the rest of the circuit. So here's our IV characteristic for our N-channel MOSFET. Looks something like this. Uh, for this analysis, I'm going to simplify things and assume that it's a piecewise continuous IV characteristic that looks like a resistor for voltages below VDSAT where it's operating in the linear region and it looks like a current source where the current is just our on current when I'm in the saturated region. That's a simplification but it'll give us the gist of what happens. So at time T equals zero we have a voltage VDS across the MOSFET and as we switch the voltage drops Initially, the drain current doesn't drop very much because we're in the saturated region. So we just have a constant current that's pulling charge out of the, out of the capacitor. Eventually, however, we're going to hit a point where the transistor will move into the linear regime. And then the current starts to drop as we pull more charge out. So then the transition gets slower because it slows down as we continue to lower the voltage. Okay. So how would we analyze that? Well, we rem remember that current is C times dV dt. Just because of the sign convention I'm using here, it's positive when it flows into the drain, so that's why I have a negative sign here. So that's our basic relation for the current in a capacitor. Now, I can solve that for V out. It's just V out is equal to V dd 
In the time period when I'm in the saturated region, the current is constant. So ID of T is just I on. So I can get a simple expression. The output current, uh, the output voltage just drops linearly with time as long as I'm in that saturated region. Now what happens when I hit T1? Now we hit the linear regime. When we hit T1, the MOSFET just looks like a resistor. And you right, might remember that when you have a resistor in parallel with a capacitor, you have an RC time constant. And when you discharge that capacitor, the voltage just drops as e to the minus t over tau. So once I hit T1, that particular time, now I just have a characteristic time constant that's the channel resistance times the switching capacitance. That channel resistance is just VD sat divided by I on, and I have a the rest of the transient then is now is not linear, but it's exponential as e to the minus t over tau, where tau is a characteristic time. Okay, so that's the basic uh, explanation of why this transition looks approximately linear to begin with. Not exactly because the current isn't exactly constant, and then it looks up as exponential for longer times. So we can understand very simply that time. Now, if I want to ask, what's the switching time? It's a little hard to define, you know, how close to zero do you have to get? So by convention, we'll just ask, how much time does it take to reduce the output voltage to one half of its initial value? Now that makes things simple because we're usually still in the saturated region at that point. So the decay was linear. We'll call that time tau sub n, the delay time. And we simply take this expression in the initial part where the decay is linear. And the time delay that we're interested in, we're calling tau. That's the time it takes to reduce the output voltage to half of its initial power supply voltage. So we get a simple expression for the delay time. Capacitance times voltage, that's the charge that was stored initially in the current. Ion is charge per unit time, so charge divided by charge per unit time gives me the delay. The factor of two comes in because we're defining our delay time to be the time it takes to drop the voltage to one half of its initial value. So I can write this in a very simple form. R switch of the n-channel device times the capacitance being switched, where R switch of the n-channel device is simply the power supply voltage divided by ID on times a numerical factor kappa that turns out to be one half. Okay, so we get a very simple way to estimate the delay. R switch times C capacitance. In practice, the current isn't quite constant, so it's not, it's less than I on because it drops a little bit. There's some output slope. It's some average current during that switching transient, and people refer to that as the effective current. But the basic idea is illustrated here. And now we can see, understand already why there's so much emphasis on achieving high on currents. High on currents pull the charge out of that capacitor quickly and give me short delay times. So a high on current can put charge in quickly, pull charge out quickly, and make the circuit run very fast. Now in a circuit, we'll have a lot of capacitors. You know, so this switching capacitance consists of several components. The drain regions of the PMOS and NMOS are attached to P-type and N-type wells. So there is a depletion capacitance there. There's an output capacitance that's associated with that. Uh, the wires that are connecting the output to the other gates that follow, give me some additional capacitance. And then we might be connecting to several different input capacitances of other gates, and that's called fan out. So the total capacitance is a sum of a whole bunch of capacitances, and as devices get, or chips get more and more complex, and we have more and more wiring, and we have more and more transistors on them, uh, managing these capacitances is a, is a very big challenge for people. Okay, so in particular, this interconnect capacitance, so one of the challenges is that there are a few places in a circuit where the interconnects have to be very long. You have to send a signal a long ways across the chip. That can add a lot of capacitance and can slow down the signal, so there are uh, circuit techniques that people use to deal with that.
So if we want to understand this, it's just R switch times capacitance. And uh, we'll get plots that look like this. As the capacitance of the wires increases, the delay increases. If we have more fan out, if we're connecting the output to more devices, we have more delay. If we go to very short wires, which would be local interconnects, they wouldn't add much delay. The long wires, the global interconnects that go long distances add a lot of delay. Our intercepts down here would just be the output capacitance of the inverter and, uh, and in addition the fan out to the next gate that, that we're uh, driving. Okay. So interconnect design is an uh, important design. You know, For the gate channel of a MOSFET we want a high dielectric constant so that we get a lot of inversion layer charge. For the, uh, for the wiring, which may be 10 layers or more on a chip, we want low dielectric constants to minimize the capacitance associated with the wiring. So technologists talk about high K for the gate and low K for the interconnects. I'll just briefly mention one other capacitance that people worry about a bit. Now, if we look at this device, there's a little bit of overlap between the metal electrode and the drain, which gives us a small overlap capacitance that we have to worry about. Now, it turns out that when you have a capacitance that's between the input, the gate, and the output, the drain, it's particularly worrisome for circuit designers. And we can see why that is with some simple arguments. If we look at a transition for the input going from a zero to a one, then we can look at what happens, well, the output is going to go from a one to a zero because this uh, device is in an inverter. So if we look at what happens before the switching event, we have a voltage zero on the input and VDD on the output, so the voltage across the capacitor is minus VDD. A long time after the switching event, we have a voltage VDD on the input and zero on the output, so the voltage across the capacitor is plus VDD. That means if we look at the change in voltage across the capacitance, it's twice VDD in this particular circuit when you hook the capacitor up that way. And that means that the charge is the change in the output voltage, the voltage across the capacitor, uh, times that capacitance. It means it's two VDD times C overlap. So people will talk, call this a Miller capacitance. When you put a capacitor in a circuit in this way between the input and an inverting output, then the capacitor has the effect that it appears from a circuit perspective to be twice as big as it physically is. So there's a lot of worry about technologists in trying to minimize this drain to gate overlap capacitance because it can be particularly uh, worrisome in inverting circuits like this. So the key message from all of this is on current determines speed. It determines how fast we can put charge into the capacitor, how fast we can pull charge out of the capacitor. So it's an important performance metric. And you know, real devices, the current isn't quite constant. It's not quite the on current here. It's some average current. But the basic idea is conveyed by the on current. Now, you, some of you might be wondering, I sort of made a quasi, what we would call a quasi-static assumption here. I'm using the DC transistor characteristic. And I'm assuming that the transistor is fast enough that as this voltage changes during the switching transient, the transistor can respond and it's operating and delivering the current as though it were operating in the DC mode at the particular voltage at that particular time. That's called a quasi-static assumption. The intrinsic response of the transistor is usually so fast that we can make that assumption. I've also made this simplified IV characteristic, but it gives us the, the important part of the answer, and we can simply replace I on by an appropriate average I during the switching transient if we want to improve it. That's what people call an effective current. Okay, the second topic that we're discussing today is uh, power. So let's think about how we determine what power is consumed during this switching transient. So now think about my input voltage being a signal that goes between 0 and 1 with a period capital T. So my output voltage is going to go from 0 to 1 in the same kind of period. And we're trying to understand what power would we dissipate while doing that. Well, remember from freshman physics or circuit analysis that 
when you charge up a capacitor, you store an electrostatic energy in the capacitance of one half C V squared. So before we switch, we have energy stored in the capacitor that came by charging it up from the power supply through the PMOS device. After we switch the end channel off, we dump that energy to ground and dissipate it. So that's power that's, dis that's been dissipated. And we can easily take a look at that. Let's just look at the discharge cycle. We've charged up the capacitor and put some energy in it. In half the period now, we will discharge it and dump it to ground and dissipate it. Power is energy divided by time. So we take the initial energy. The final energy is zero. The period is T over two, the time duration. And we end up that the dynamic power is C VDD squared times one over the period, which is the frequency. And then people will usually put in something called an activity factor. Because in the circuit, every transistor isn't switching on every cycle. You know, there's some percentage. It might be a tenth, it might be a hundredth, whatever it is in the particular digital circuit, which uh, is just a fraction of the time that this particular transistor is switching. Now, I only looked at the discharge cycle. You know, what about the other half when you're putting energy in the capacitor? This takes a little bit of discussion, so I'll just give you the answer. It's, it's the same way. It costs energy to charge up the capacitor. When we put an energy one-half CVD squared into the capacitor and store it, it actually costs us an energy of one-half CVDD squared to do that. That takes a little more discussion. It's uh, discussed in some uh, circuit design textbooks and things that I could point you to if you're interested in understanding how all of that operates. But the question, the, you know, the Everything is symmetrical. The analysis that we did on the discharge cycle applies to the charging cycle too. So designers struggle with a power delay trade-off. You know, the circuit speed is proportional to this RC time constant, which means the delay is, goes as one over the on current, and the on current goes as VDD minus VT. So I could use a high power supply to get a high on current, or I could use a low VT to get a high on current, and I'd have a fast circuit. Now, so frequency goes as VDD minus VT. Now what about power? So this switching power or dynamic power that we talk about goes as frequency times VDD squared. So the frequency goes as VDD. So what we find is really that the power is scaling up as VDD cubed. So as I improve the speed, I increase the power. That's just a fundamental trade-off that it's hard to get around. Now, we also have static power or leakage power when we're not switching. So this is a factor that only in the last decade or so has it become really important. And uh, that's when the device is just sitting there and the off currents are flowing and we have some static power dissipation. You may remember we talked briefly about off currents and off currents vary as e to the minus q threshold voltage over mkt. So if I lower the threshold voltage to increase the speed, I increase the off current exponentially and the static power increases. So that's another trade-off. Designers are really constrained with trying to get high power or high speed without excessive power dissipation at the same time. And that's the kind of design challenge that uh, designers uh, worry about. You can easily increase speed, but that increases the dy dynamic power. You can I increase it through the power supply or by decreasing uh, the threshold voltage, but you're constrained by these trade-offs no matter what you do. All right, so uh, just to summarize the key metrics we have from a digital logic point of view. There's the switching energy, which we tried to keep low. There's the delay, which we tried to keep low. There's a dynamic power, which we try to keep low. And sometimes we talk about the energy delay product when we want to manage that trade-off between the two. Okay. Now we can apply these metrics to the device and then C is the capacitance of the device. We could also apply it to the circuit. And then C is the switching capacitance, that's all of the wire capacitance and fan out and everything else. Okay. So if you look at this, for example, for 65 uh, nanometer technology, the switching energy is small, 21 attajoules for a device. And the switching delay is less than a picosecond. 
and uh, you can compute energy delay products and things like that too. But if you take a look at an actual circuit, you know, the power dissipation is on the order of 100 watts. The actual logic core that's doing most of the computation burns about 20 of those watts. And we can use our simple expression to try to deduce what the average switching capacitance is. So in this case, I got about 10 femtofarads per node. And then we can deduce the average switching energy. And you can see that instead of a few attajoules, it's 6,000 attajoules. So the message is that when you put a device in a realistic circuit, the delay increases significantly because the capacitances increase, the power increases significantly. So it's the transition from device to circuit is really a very, very important one. Uh, as I mentioned, 400 times, in this particular example, there was a 400 times increase in delay. There was a 300 times increase in ener switching energy and the energy delay product increased by five orders of magnitude. So these days, people are in a power-constrained design mode that without, you know, at modest expense, one can cool a chip that dissipates about 100 watts per square centimeter without going to anything too sophisticated. So your design cannot dissipate more than 100 watts per square centimeter. Now, what we find versus integration density is that as you make devices smaller and smaller and smaller, they leak more and more and more. Our off currents tend to increase. So as we make them smaller, then the standby power, when we're not switching, increases. If the standby power gets to 100 watts per square centimeter, then you can't do anything useful with the chip. You can't switch it and do any digital logic. So as you get faster and faster integration density, when you're low and there isn't much static power dissipation, all of your energy can be can be useful energy, active, dynamic power. But as you go to higher and higher levels of, of integration, you have to add the standby power and the dynamic power. The two have to add up to your power budget of 100 watts per square centimeter. So you can see that the more dynamic power you can burn, the faster the chip operates. But if you already have a significant amount of standby power, then you can only afford a certain amount of dynamic power, and that constrains how fast your circuit can operate. And you can sort of see, it sort of intuitively makes sense that when the leakage power is half of the of your total power budget, it doesn't make much sense to go further than that. You're really constrained to stay there. So there's an optimum device size. You don't want to make devices too small and put too many of them on the chip, or the performance will suffer. Now, another question that people ask is, why can't we just lower VDD? Power goes as VDD squared. Let's just make VDD lower. And one of our big constraints there just has to do with the IV characteristics of the transistors that we've been getting familiar with. So we have this shape here of the transfer characteristic, log ID versus VGS. On current is proportional to VDD minus VT. If we lower the power supply voltage, we'll lower the on current. and We won't be able to charge and discharge the capacitors as well. Uh, we're constrained to manage our dynamic power. We can't let the leakage power get too big. So we have to specify an off current and we can't let it get any bigger than that. Now the shape of this particular curve is constrained by physics. The steepness of this off to on transition can't be steeper than 60 millivolts per decade because that's a fundamental limit for a barrier controlled device. So when you just put in the typical numbers that you can tolerate for off current, the typical numbers that you need for on current, the shape of this IV characteristic constrains us so that in order to make this all work, we need about one volt for a silicon MOSFET. People are beginning to get a little bit below that. A lot of the research activities these days is directed towards things called low voltage switches. Now, is there some way that you can make a switching device that will operate at much lower voltages but give you the on current and off current that you need to be useful in circuits? So that's a big question in uh, device research. Okay, so this has been a long lecture and I've covered a lot of ground, so let me just wrap up quickly by emphasizing the key points that you should take away. Speed is controlled by on current, which is why that's a key device metric. 
dynamic power goes is VDD squared, which is try why we try to lower the VDD as much as possible. Uh, static power is controlled by the threshold voltage because off-current increases exponentially as the threshold voltage drops. So that whole speed-power trade-off that designers are uh, struggling with these days is constrained by the physics of the MOSFET. Okay. All right, so uh, we've covered digital logic very quickly in two lectures. Hopefully it gives you a sense as to what the important considerations are. In the next lecture, we'll take a quick look at analog and RF applications.